الجامعة الافتراضية السورية كتاب القانون الدولي للدكتور عماد الدين محمد تقدمت مبادرة الضوء بصوت رغد حمام International Environmental Law Learning Objectives By the end of this chapter, you should be able to Define environmental law Explain what issues environmental law encompasses Identify when environmental law was established Understand the problems that led to the formulation of environmental law Refer to the international conferences and conventions that gave rise to the establishment of environmental law. Trace the historical origins that led to the development of environmental law. Be aware of the various substantive principles that are contained within environmental law. Explain the components of the substantive principles. Understand the meaning of the principle of Poulter Pays and why this is important. Be aware of the principles of process that are contained within environmental law. What is environmental law? Environmental law is an organized system that utilizes all the laws in the legal system to minimize prevent, punish, or remedy the consequences of any actions that damage or threaten the environment as well as public health and safety. In a sense, environmental law is a system that can invoke any legislative processes that govern environmental, public health, and safety purposes. A. The birth of the Stockholm Conference Prior to the 19th century, some efforts had been made to address pollution on a local level. Example, smoke, noise, and water pollution. But it was only in the 19th century that the first international agreements concerning shared resources were established which resulted with international fishing treaties and agreements to protect various plant species. The first global convention to enter into force for the protection of designated wildlife species was 1902. Convention for the Protection of Birds Useful to agriculture. Early treaties, the bilateral United States Great Britain Treaty relating to the preservation and protection of fur seals, 1911, and the Interim Convention on Conservation of North Pacific Fur Seals, 1957. Despite being narrowly focused, were responsible for establishing legal precedents which were widely followed in later MIAS. These treaties called for strict enforcement measures, national quotas, and the regulation of international trade in objects which have been sourced from seal hunting. As a state could not protect water quality without the cooperation from another state, a number of early boundary treaties concerning water pollution contained measures aimed to reduce and to prevent water pollution. The Agreement for Respecting Boundary Waters, which was made between the United States and Canada in 1909, is still considered the model agreement. Following the World War I, other riparian states entered into boundary water agreements that included provisions to deal with water pollution and as such international commissions were then established. 
The Convention Relative to the Preservation of Fauna and Flora in their Natural State, 1933, was applied to colonial Africa. The London Convention and the Convention on Natural Protection and Wild Preservation in the Western Hemisphere, 1940, envisaged the establishment of reserves and the protection of wild animals and plants, especially migrating birds. After World War II, the international community responded to specific environmental threats which were being caused by technology and economic expansion. The growing use of super tankers to transport oil by sea led to the first efforts to combat marine pollution during the 1950s. Furthermore, the utilization of nuclear energy led to other international regulation. The current ecological era was born after the 1960s, as people become more aware of the increasing damage being done not just to the environment but also to human health. As a result, more informed public opinion damaged protective measures to be implemented to safeguard nature and people. In 1963, a treaty was established to restrict military uses of radioactive materials. See the treaty banning nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, outer space and underwater. It was only a matter of time before international organizations realized the urgency concerning these new environmental concerns. The catalyst for this was undoubtedly media coverage, which often highlighted such concerns. One such concern, which the media was keen to cover, was the first oil tank disaster in 1967. The oil tanker Torrey Canyon came to ground and caused a huge oil spillage off the coasts of France, Belgium and England sharply emphasized the growing threats to the environment. It was this incident which promoted the United Nations to take actions in 1968 in an attempt to address such threats. It was not until 1972 that the United Nations General Assembly convened the world. Conference on the Human Environment, which was held in Stockholm, the conference was extremely well attended, indicating the serious environmental concerns at that time. An action plan containing 109 recommendations and a resolution proposing institutional and financial commitments by the United Nations were endorsed making them the first comprehensive statements of international concern for environmental protection. The Stockholm meeting was held in June 5th to 16th and included 6,000 delegates from 113 states, including representatives of every major intergovernmental organization, 700 observers from 400 non-governmental organizations, invited individuals and approximately 1,500 journalists. Principle 1 is was the first statement of a link between environmental protection and human rights and as such resulted in considerable jurisprudence. Principles 2 to 7 proclaims that the natural resources of world include oil, minerals, air, water, earth, plants and animals, as well as natural ecosystems, and that is essential that renewable resources are able to replenish while non-renewable resources should not be wasted. These are issues which do not just affect present populations, but also will affect future populations. There is also a call to stop production of toxic wastes or other matter that cannot be observed by the environment and for the prevention of marine pollution. Principles 13 to 15 underline the necessity of integrated, 
coordinated and rational development planning. The last group of principles, 21 to 26, is of particular interest in the development of international environmental law. Principle 21 is generally recognized as expressing a basic norm of customary international environmental law. Principle 22 follows this by calling on states to cooperate in developing international law regarding liability and compensation for victims of pollution and other extraterritorial environmental damage. Principle 23 recommends that states further develop international environmental law, taking into consideration the system of values prevailing in each country and in particular in developing countries. B. From Stockholm to Rio. After the Stockholm Conference, there was an expansion of international environmental law. In 1980s, issues such as long-range air pollution and depletion of ozone layer became a matter of concern. This led to the United Nations General Assembly voting to create the World Commission on Environment and Development in 1983 known as the Brundtland Commission. This report led the UN to convene a second global conference on the environment in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. This was the UN Conference on Environmental and Development, UNICED. The Brundtland Report was an independent external body, through it was linked to the United Nations. UNICEF met in Rio de Janeiro from June 3rd to 14th, 1992. 172 states, all but six members of the UN, were represented by almost 10,000 delegates including 116 heads of state and government, with Japan sending 300 delegates. 1,400 non-governmental organizations were accredited, as well as almost 9,000 journalists. Five texts were generated from this meeting. Two important conventions were drafted and adopted before the conference and were opened for signature at Rio. These were the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Convention on Biological Diversity. Two texts adopted at UNICED have a general scope. The Declaration on Environmental and Development and Action Program called Agenda 21. The declaration is a short statement of 27 principles. The central concept is sustainable development, as defined by the Brutland Report, which integrates both development and environmental protection. Principle 4 is important in this regard, as it affirms that to achieve sustainable development, Environmental protection shall constitute an integral part of the development process and cannot be considered in isolation from it. The Rio Declaration contains several principles of general legal character by reinforcing some of the existing principles while proclaiming new ones. Principle 2, which concerns the transboundary effects of activities, reaffirms Principle 21 of the Stockholm Declaration, but adds the word developmental. Other pre-existing legal norms are reaffirmed in the following principles. Principle 10 affirms the rights to public information, participation and remedies. 
Principle 13 calls for the development of liability rules and the principles 18 and 19 require informing other states about emergencies and the projects that may affect their environment. New international principles include the precautionary principle. Principle 15. The Poulter pays principle that requires internalization of environmental costs. Principle 16. The general requirement of environmental impact assessment for proposed activities. Principle 17. Principle 11 stresses the importance of enacting effective environmental legislation. It does, however, note that the standard applied by some countries may not be appropriate to others due to the economic and social costs. Other principles are linked to policy guidelines. Although the boundary between law and policy can be vague, a distinction can be made between three groups of policy provisions. The first group expresses concern for development and poverty alleviation within states. The second group of principles addresses the world economic order and the trade relations. The third group of principles concerns public participation. Principle 10 recognizes for individuals the rights to information, to participation, and to remedies in environmental matters. Principles 20 to 22 stresses the importance of the participation of women, youth, and indigenous people. However, the terms that are used show that these provisions should be regarded as guidelines rather than actual legal norms. The second general document adopted by the Rio Conference is Agenda 21. There are four main parts contained within Agenda 21. Socioeconomic dimensions, example, habitants, health, demography, consumption, and production patterns. Conservation and resource management, example, atmosphere, forest, water, waste, chemical products. Strengthening the role of non-governmental organizations and other social groups, such as trade unions, women and youth. Measures of implementation. Financing. Institution. Agenda 21 is a program of action consisting of 40 chapters within 115 specific topics contained in 800 pages. The chapters concerning the atmosphere, chapter 9, biological diversity, chapter 15, the oceans, chapter 17, and freshwater resources, chapter 18, Specific issues relating to biotechnology, chapter 15, toxic ch chemicals, chapter 19, and waste, chapter 20 to 22, are essential issues which have been identified as environmental law develops. Additionally, two chapters are dedicated to international institutional arrangements, chapter 38 and International Legal Instruments and Mechanisms, Chapter 39. Agenda 21 pays particular attention to national legislation and refers regularly to national laws, measures, plans, programs, and the standards. To summarize, the RIA documents unite environmental protection and economic development within the concept of substantial development. This emphasis is understandable because the current economic system presents numerous challenges to environmental protection. A. 
substantive principles. The international community has recognized the environmental problems are not exhaustive. To try to deal with environmental protection via legislation designed to resolve bilateral problems would provide only limited solutions. In fact, such actions may only risk transferring environmental harms elsewhere. As a result, various substantive principles emerge that apply to state conduct generally. 1. Prevention harm Both case law precedents and the adaption of general rules of international law have produced the foundational norm of international environmental law that prohibits trains frontier pollution. It was in the OECD Council recommendation C74-219-1974 that states defined the various types of pollution. The International Court of Justice has called the duty to prevent extraterritorial environmental harm a part of customary international law. The duty to avoid the train's frontier pollution requires each state to exercise due diligence in addressing and or preventing any negative environmental impact. This includes acting reasonably and in good faith and to regulate any public and private activities under state jurisdiction that are deemed a potential risk to environment. 2. Precaution Principle It is the precautionary principle which is the most developed form of prevention that remains the general basis for current environmental law. This means identifying and preparing for any potential, uncertain or, or even hypothetical threats even in the absence of any evidence that harm will result. This type of prevention is based on probabilities or contingencies and considers that precaution should apply when the consequences of non-action could be serious or irre irreversible. As such, policymakers must consider the circumstances of any given situation and decide whether scientific opinion is based upon credible evidence and reliable scientific methodology. 3. The polluter pays principles. The polluter pays principle seeks to impose the costs of environmental harm on the party responsible for the pollution. This principle was established by the OECD as an economic principle and as the most efficient way of allocating costs of pollution, prevention, and control measures introduced by the public authorities in member countries. The intention of polluter pays principle is to encourage rational use of, of scarce environmental resources. The intention of the polluter pays principle is to encourage rational use of scarce environmental resources and to avoid distortions in international trade and investment. The polluter pays principle is more easily applied in geographic regions subject to uniform environmental law, such as within a state or within the European Union. The polluter pays principle has been well defined within AU law. The onus is on the polluters to pay any cost of pollution control measures. These would involve measures such as the construction and operation of anti-pollution in installations. These would involve measures such as the construction and operation of anti-pollution installations, investment in, and implementation of 
anti-pollution equipment and new processes to ensure that necessary environmental quality objective can be achieved. One illustration of an application of this principle lies in the EC Directive 84-631-1984 on the control within the European community of the train's frontier shipment of, of hazardous waste. It instructs the member states to impose the costs of waste control on the holder of waste and or on prior holders of the waste generator. Four, sustainable development principle. The sustainable development principle was defined in the 1987 report of the World Commission of Environmental and Development that meets the needs of the present without the compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The report identified the critical objectives of sustainable development. Reviving growth but changing its equality. Meeting essential needs for jobs, food, energy, water and sanitation. Ensuring a sustainable level of po population. Conserving and enhancing the resource base. Reorienting technology and managing risks. Merging environment and economics in decision making. The Johnsburg World Summit on Sustainable Development focused on this concept with particular emphasis on eradicating poverty. The concept of maintaining environmental services is accepted as essential to sustainable development. Environmental services are those that are provided by the functions of nature itself. These include the protection of soil by trees, the natural filtration and purification of water, and the protection of habitants for biodiversity. B. Principles of process. Access to environmental information can assist enterprises in planning for and utilizing the best available techniques and technology. Access to early and complete data assists decisions makers to make informed choices. In addition, the process by which rules emerge, how proposed rules become norms and norms become law, is highly important to the legitimacy of the law and legitimacy in turn affects compliance. When people perceive that they have a voice in governance, they may see the decisions taken as ones in which they can be active stakeholders and which they will uphold. 1. Duty to know Both the implementation and formulation of environmental laws and policies requires the collection of reliable information and the continuous assessment of the environmental milieu. Both international and national environmental laws use surveillance, monitoring, and reporting technology to ensure the compilation of reliable information. These practices are essential for the Im implementation and formulation of environmental laws and policies. Once the information is obtained, it is must be assembled, organized and analyzed by the appropriate agency or institution to which the information is relayed. It is common to find that environmental laws require reporting by enterprises or state institutions. 2. Duty to inform and consult. 
any state that plans to undertake or authorize activities capable of having significant impact on the environment of another state must inform the latter and should transmit to it the pertinent details of the project, provided no national legislation or applicable international treaty prohibits such transmission. Treaties and state practice indicate that states should immediately inform other states that could be affected by the sudden situation or even that could cause harm to their environment and thus provide those same states with all pertinent information. This duty is borne out in several international treaties. 3. Public Participation Access to information, public participation, and access to effective judicial and administrative proceedings, including redress and remedy, should be guaranteed. This is because environmental issues are best handled with the participation of all concerned citizens at the relevant level. Participation may take place through elections, grassroots action, lobbying, public speaking, hearings, and other forms of governance, whereby various interests and communities participate in shaping the law and decisions that affect them. The major role played by the public in environmental protection is usually through participation in environmental impact or other permitting procedures. Citizens should have access to information, be entitled to participate in decision making, and have access to a judicial remedy in environmental matters. In particular, the state must promote access to computer telecommunication and other electronic technology. Public authorities are required to make available environmental information to an applicant on his or her request and to ensure individuals have access to procedures in which state acts or emissions can, can be recognized reconsidered or reviewed administratively by an independent and impartial body established by law. The end of the chapter. The end of the record.